Hello, bird nerds. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. This is the bird emergency. For those of you who've been waiting for the podcast uh, audio feed for something new to come out, I'm really sorry. I was away, and then, and then all I can say is I hadn't had anyone to talk to. But we're remedying that today because. It's a repeat, uh, a repeat visit from one of my favourite friends of the show, uh, also my favourite dead bird girl, uh, Heidi Trudell, coming to us from Chicago, USA, to talk about the massive problem. Uh, problem's not even a, a strong enough word. It's a dead set catastrophe the mortality rate of birds striking windows, falling to the ground and dying. And you may have seen the publicity that's garnered a lot of attention uh, in the US, but this problem is global and it always comes to the, uh, to the forefront of attention during the migration season. Today is... World Migratory Bird Day, and it's also the Global Big Day, so it's a very big day for bird nerds. <sighs> Without further delay and waffle from me, Heidi, welcome back to the Bird Emergency. Thanks for How, having me. Uh, let Let's just start straight away. What What happened in in Chicago that drew so much attention for bird nerds and non-bird nerds around the world just a matter of uh, a, a week ago, I think, was it? It was a week ago yesterday. So officially I am back in Michigan, but last week I was in Chicago, pure coincidence, uh, to give a talk, of course, on bird safe buildings. And um, as I was driving to Chicago from Michigan, pouring rain, um, my phone was blowing up with texts from a friend who works at the Field Museum in Chicago, which uh, fortunately slash unfortunately is the home of all of the dead birds that hit in Chicago. And the photos that he sent were the ones that y'all have been seeing in the press. Um, one building in the span of Thursday morning killed, last count was 964 birds um and this building has a 45 year record of killing birds but what makes it really just absolutely um, mind-blowing is that this was a year's worth of birds in one day this building tends to kill between 500 and a thousand birds a year uh, i keep saying this building it's mccormick place everyone knows it's mccormick place we've been yelling at them for 30 years uh, out of 45 years worth of data uh, to do something about it. But in 45 years of dead things, they have done a whole lot of not anywhere near enough to address the problem. Is there anything that is peculiar to this building that makes it such a uh, massive slaughterer of birds? Yeah, so it... So Chicago is the deadliest city in North America for birds. Um, a few factors lead to that. Um, geographically, it's at the southern end of Lake Michigan. So when birds, especially during migration, when birds are flying across the lake, Chicago is right on the lake shore. So instead of like a fair chunk of Ohio uh, and Lake Erie is woodland, um, Granted, a lot of it is agricultural, but it's not glass. And Chicago, relatively speaking, has a lot of glass. There's not just uninterrupted woodland that would have been there you know, 200, 300 years ago. Um, so you have high volume migration plus this deadly combination of a geographic funnel leading straight to this massive city uh, which is both brightly lit and full of glass. So the building in question is on the lakeshore. 
it's very wide, it's very low. It's not a high rise by any stretch of the imagination. It is not a skyscraper. Um, it is a convention center that uh, when they host events, they leave it up to the people hosting the event uh, as to whether or not they want to leave the lights on at night, which I have strong opinions about. Um, but also it is a wall of glass. So the combined factors, you put the worst possible building in the worst possible place in the worst possible city for it. And this is what we got. Uh, and those factors combined with uh, Birdcast did an amazing job of covering the weather factors that led to this particular movement. Um, unfortunately, the petition that's circulating right now is trying to get McCormick Place to turn the lights off. Yes, lights are a huge problem for McCormick Place, uh, and they do absolutely need to be addressed. Um, but also their glass is a huge problem. And for Thursday, the vast majority of the strikes were during the actual you know, dawn and morning portion of the not middle of the night when you would expect, I mean, not middle of the night necessarily. Lights lights are bad anytime <laughs> that it's dark out. There, I, I don't wanna sound like a hardliner on that because there are dark sky protocols that can be followed for like healthy, appropriate lighting. Um, but Chicago as a city does not do a good job of that. And while there are buildings that participate in their lights out program, um, you really need like the entire region to be doing that to, to actually be helping birds. The majority of the birds, I, I think from, from what, what you were saying were probably met their fate in sort of that dawn and dusk period. And for people who are not in in the US and probably in the Africa Eurasian flyway as well, we're not f sort of familiar with the absolute density, the concentration of of birds moving along the flyway in the Americas on just a handful of, of nights, really, um, going north and south and, and coming, uh, going both directions. Now, I, 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 I know you want to tell me it's a longer period, but there are these, I mean, the, the, the radar imagery that, that lots of people put out now showing the concentrations, the, the, the Doppler, um, uh, the Doppler imagery um, enabling people to, give some sort of uh, uh, reasonably accurate estimate of the numbers of birds that are traversing on any night. But yeah. uh, what, what, what I wanted to ask is, are birds also hitting, hitting these buildings, these windows? Let's, let's be clear. They're windows. It's panes of glass. It's that... If the buildings were made of something else, there'd still be birds colliding with them, but there would be less. I think that's that's fair um, to say, isn't it? There, there are a few different levels there to unpack. Um, the buildings could be made of stone and have super bright lights and still be very problematic, yes. Um, however, for the daytime collisions, glass is absolutely the leading cause. I mean, you can have polished steel or in some cases, birds have been documented striking polished granite, um, but pretty much any other material, unless it's an extremely foggy day and you've got a gray wall or you know, white side of a warehouse, um, you're going to reduce strikes dramatically by having a non-glass surface. Um, the, the nuance here is Nocturnal strikes versus daytime strikes. Chicago gets the worst of both, essentially. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that really addresses your question. But uh, well, well, is there like is it a very minor percentage of the overall? You know, let's approximate a thousand birds killed in one in one 24 hour period that were picked up 
uh, at McCormick Place. Uh, uh, is it like 10% of those happen during the bright daylight hours or or is there a more even spread? Like I'm just trying to get an idea for um, – because there's different protocols that could well, there's probably consistent protocols that could be uh, applied to cities worldwide to reduce uh, the the deaths of the deaths of birds colliding them. And and let, uh, let let's throw that number out. Just in the American Flyway alone, the estimate is over a billion birds each year, and it's probably similar numbers in at least two of the other flyways. Uh, but that the concentration of where, of where they die is much less. So so the publicity is not as great. The awareness is not as yeah. great. Um, what What's frustrating about this situation is it's on the heels of, uh, I think it was two years ago, that New York City had one building or one route that had, I think, 230 birds died. Uh, and then uh, around the same time, maybe a year or two earlier, uh, I've slept since then, Galveston, Texas had a bank building that killed almost 400 birds in a night. Um, these are making the news because you know, we're actually seeing the tangible results of the strikes. But um, generally speaking, even the, the urban collision monitors where there are people out intentionally looking for these strikes every day, um, their detection rates are 20% or less because they're up against ravens and gulls and raccoons, people cleaning the sidewalks, you name it. They're not finding anywhere near the actual amount of what's hitting. So when, when we look at the way strikes happen, so Chicago, Cleveland, um, New York City, places that are geographically funneled and very predictably impacted by lights. Um, Cleveland has great protocol. They go out at like four in the morning. Um, I hope to never ever wake up at four in the morning <laughs> for bird stuff ever again. But um, they literally walk their routes. Um, I think they've got three or four routes. But basically, they will just walk loops until they have stopped picking up birds. And sometimes that's nine in the morning. So that's a lot of miles that they trek in the name of picking up every survivor that they can and documenting, unfortunately, all of the birds that, that die. But I will say that my specialty has been low rise buildings in not quite urban areas. So not quite rural necessarily, but um, most of the buildings that I've worked on have been in the Midwest. So Southern Illinois, Southeast Michigan, um, nothing terribly exciting or fancy. Most of them are five stories or less. But what we have found is the volunteers who like waking up super early and make their rounds at seven in the morning aren't finding hardly anything. But the volunteers who go out at like 10 a.m. or two in the afternoon, they're the ones who pick up the vast majority of what hits. Um, there are a couple different reasons for that. But when we have protocols that are based on buildings that are not necessarily ours, um, you can, there was a school in, I believe, upstate New York that had a protocol of 7 a.m. They could hardly get students to volunteer to, to do the coverage, but um, I don't blame them. But they found hardly anything monitored for an entire fall season, which is when strikes tend to be worse. Um, I think they found like seven birds the entire time. Now, statistically speaking, if you're only checking at 7 a.m., you have all day long for, in this case, a small college campus. So that's a lot of squirrels, a lot of chipmunks. Um, who knows about the status cats. boxes? Yeah, who knows about the raccoons and cats, um, coyotes. But basically, that left a full 24 hours of things to hit potentially during the day. Um, get scavenged also potentially during the day and certainly at night before students were walking the route again at seven in the morning. Um, I found that in Illinois, I would check on my way to class, but if I had an 8 a.m. class, I 
maybe picked up one or two birds before class, but it was always on my way to lunch that I had to stop by the dorm freezer to drop things off um, because that was when the birds were hitting. So in a large city, if you are going out too late, uh, by large city, I mean, um, again, I always reference Cleveland and Chicago because if they were to go out at like 10 a.m., they would probably not find hardly anything unless it's you know, run over, which, oh, that was depressing. Um, in Chicago, the morning of my talk, so Friday, the day after the, the epic die-off um, mass casualty event, um, I didn't even have to walk across the street from the hotel to see a dozen birds run over in the street and you know half a dozen others that were just on the sidewalk. Um, but had we gone out a couple hours later, none of those would have been there. They either would have been cleaned up by folks who work at the buildings, um, trotted off by, we did see one herring gull carrying something that looked very sparrowy. Um, so yeah, what, what we're finding is barely the tip of the iceberg. And there are some recent studies that indicate that what we find might be, you know, for every one we find, there might be five to eight that we don't. Hmm. Um, I'll just note that while we're having this discussion, we are streaming live. So for podcast listeners, if you would like to catch all of the conversations I have live, and that gives you the opportunity to make a comment or ask a question, you can do that um, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and sometimes... Uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. You can't ask questions and comment on Twitter. I refuse to call it the other thing. Um, reason for interrupting the conversation saying that is, Kayla, uh, I have noticed what you're saying and we will be, uh, we'll be discussing that a little bit later in the, in the conversation. But the, uh, this, I think, is the, it's either the third or fourth time. It's, I think it's the third time that Heidi's joined me for the the bird emergency and if you knew it's only the what... second oh did did we it's only the second yeah no it's not no i think it's mm -hmm. i think it's only the second time that we've um we've gone live i think i i think i had a uh, anyway anyway i think <laughs> anyway it's like we've we've known each other forever heidi was one of the very early uh bird emergency interviews so if you don't know Heidi uh, and and what she does and the reason for Heidi being my um, uh, uh, my my dead bird window uh, go to person is that Heidi now advises architects and uh, city planners about things that they can do to reduce the mortality of birds from window strike. But Heidi, let's go back to the first time we chatted, and you uh, told me that you were the bird, uh, the dead bird girl, and you just referenced get, walking around campus. Mm -hmm. I I seem to remember one of the buildings that 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 you always were picking up dead birds in the morning was a library on the campus. Is that right? And then there was yeah. another one that was notorious in in the town i think which was like maybe a four a four story just normal office office building yep so can, yeah can you remarkably good memory <laughs> um well it it's it's because coming from australia where we don't have these mass migration events i mean i got excited the other morning because i saw five of our black swans in formation flying from the south to the north across my urban area in northwest Melbourne, mm -hmm. that that was unusual, you know. And and I've seen pelicans here doing uh, uh, doing a similar flight path, but they're going to take advantage of floodwaters. Mm -hmm. So so we we don't have this regular uh, north south. We do have regular altitudinal and 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 uh and other migrations but they're nothing like the scale they're more opportunist opportunistic sort of 
uh, nomadic movements rather than these regular passage migra- migrations. But what what I'd like you to to tell people is how how did you get into early morning walks around your your campus at university, picking up dead birds and sticking them in a freezer? <laughs> so um, I started bird watching. Oh gosh, middle of 1998, and fairly quickly realized that there are research communities uh, where you can donate dead birds to you know, research collections. Um, Texas A&M University and the Houston Museum of Natural Science were, were my local ones back in the day. Um, so it was kind of in my periphery that dead things could be used for science, which of course that Facebook group uh, wasn't started till 2014. But um, yeah, it, it was something that I knew was a thing, but I was paying attention to live birds. Um, but I, I guess my dead bird conservation supervillain story would be um, summer of 2003, I was volunteering with Cornell University banding baby tree swallows, which are tiny and adorable and the cutest things ever. Um, But I had never seen morning warblers because on the Texas coast, between school and migration and timing, um, I had missed morning warblers entirely somehow. So there was a breeding pair um, at Cornell's Sapsucker Woods property. And every weekend, or at least every my weekend, when we volunteers had some time off, I would go to the the spot in Sapsucker Woods to see these morning warblers because there was a known pair that was established. They'd been breeding there for a dozen years, half a dozen years. They're not that old. Um, But uh, yeah, I I went out when they were nest building, went out when they were incubating. Like you, I was just learning their life stages through observation. And one weekend I went and they were nowhere to be seen. They should have been feeding babies or being very active and somehow, you know, not gone. So I freaked out and ended up asking around and found out that one of the students needed a pair of morning warblers for some tissue samples, which I get it. Tissue samples are a thing that are important and I understand why they need to happen but also that was my life pair of morning warblers and they were like why would anyway so i knew that birds hold on hold on let let, let, let me stop you there (laughs) so they needed these warblers for tissue samples yeah but did but did you leave out the bit where they had actually caught them and killed them um collected specimens they, they yeah they were okay caught, well probably shot and killed for research but yeah so um that didn't sit well with me because i knew that there are plenty of dead things out there that you can get perfectly good tissue samples from and so i kind of made it my goal in life to uh make sure that every dead thing that was in usable condition which turns out there are a lot of things that are usable <laughs> regardless of smell um so yeah my, my mission in life was to just like offset those poor birds like <laughs> they were in the middle of nesting and anyway uh, point being when i started uh college that fall so august officially was my 20th dead bird anniversary um i was going to school in southern illinois and people started telling me about dead birds they were finding around campus because they knew that I liked birds. And the first two or three, I didn't really think too much of it because, like, you know, that's not good. But the campus really only had, like, ten buildings that were worth looking at. Um, but I started asking around because, like, I don't know, four birds in ten weeks seems kind of bad. <laughs> I had no idea. Um so that spring, I had tracked down the ornithology teacher and asked if I could do an independent study. Um, and she said, well, it's, it's really not a problem. So, you know, n- no, 
basically. No, nothing to see here. Exactly. She'd been teaching there for like a decade and, you know, she could count the bird strikes on one hand. So, um, but, oh, uh, so, sorry to jump in again too, but that, but that's quite an understandable attitude, even for yeah. somebody who should know, who yeah. should be aware because the awareness is only new. And as you've mentioned before, most birds that succumb to bird strike don't get seen because an opportunistic scavenger has probably removed them. Or bushes. They're, the yeah, landscaping oh, around buildings is such that birds can fall into the bushes or the ground cover and you'll never right. see them. Don't even have to have them scavenged. You yeah. just won't see them where they fall. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, um, at that point, she was actually my advisor. Uh, then I switched to being a history major. Point being, um, she, yeah. <laughs> so in it, we were on the <laughs> So in the first 10 One weeks... One of the very few Americans with a grasp of history. <laughs> um, it turns out that uh, I've been repeating history for the last 20 years because the dead birds just don't stop. Um, no. I can't, I, I, I can't resist it. Has Donald Trump done a rally lately um, and actually blamed the Democrats for, for bird strike in Chicago? Uh, he has not mentioned it yet. No, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure the wind farm. It's coming. <laughs> anyway, um, no the uh, the sad part was in ten weeks. So the the spring quarter on campus, I picked up something like it was over thirty dead birds and a couple injured ones, and so I dropped the bag of frozen birds on her desk and was like, now can I do an independent study? Um, <laughs> So that fall, uh, I do not suggest this. It's probably very unhealthy. Um, highly suggest a good therapist. But uh, that fall, in the mornings before class, I would walk around three buildings. And then between classes, I would walk around the three buildings. And then in the evening, if there was a building that I hadn't had a chance to get to, I would walk around it on my way to or from dinner. Um, yeah, so that fall we picked up over 60 birds, uh, sent at least half a dozen, probably closer to a dozen to rehab. A bunch of them were hummingbirds. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it was it's not, not great to be one person on a campus where the students were fantastic and supportive. Um, I would get messages at all hours of day and night with reports of where birds were on campus. Um, but man, faculty and staff were not thrilled <laughs> by because I would sneak around and like put up uh, index cards on all of the buildings saying, if you see a dead bird, call this phone number. Um, <laughs> very effective. Uh, every community bulletin had my info. But um, yeah, that was very stressful. And the following, so that would have been fall of 2004. Fall of 2005 rolled around and I had been talking with the facilities folks constantly um, about fixing the windows. Uh, there were also like ventilation grates that were just big enough for hummingbirds to fall down underneath and get trapped. So they would be buzzing around under the grates, just trapped there until they died. So it was like, um, they would see that I had moved a grate and they would move it back. And the next day I would see that they had moved the grate back and I would move it off again. Anyway, so it was just cat and mouse back and forth over and over and over and over until finally they actually did put like a, a mesh screen over the ventilation grates, which made my life so much easier. That way anything that was on it was dead and not like maybe fell through and then died of exhaustion from being trapped. Um, that was just gutting. But the, for the rest of the, the library in particular on that campus, um, they had put like half a dozen window clings per ginormous pane of sheet glass, which even at that point, um, I think even through 2010, 2011, the handprint rule was still the accepted spacing um, for collision products or collision deterrent attempts because the uv leaves they don't they don't work 
um, unless you like cram them super close together. But uh, even at that point, they said, you need to have one per square foot of glass to be effective. And half a dozen on sheet glass was nowhere near adequate. But the facilities people were congratulating themselves because they only had like, I think that building had a dozen strikes that fall. And they were like, it worked. No, it did not work because every other building on campus saw the same decrease in strikes. Because I don't know if migration that year had pushed things further east or further west or what the deal was. Maybe it was just better tailwinds, but we hardly got any strikes on campus that fall. Um, so yeah, that was that was how it started. And now I live near big shiny libraries. But since we last spoke, um, the newest library in Washtenaw County used 100% coverage on their new building. Um, it's two by two, first surface acid etched dots, and I love it. So we'll we'll talk about in a minute specifically what can be done to pre, to minimise. I don't think we're ever going to prevent bird strike, but uh, window collisions. But it can be minimised. You, you, yes. The the evidence is is there for that. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, Kayla, hold on. Uh, but what I'd like you to do for people who are not familiar with with the birds that are moving through the North American Flyway, tell us about the kinds of birds that are the regularly or are most susceptible um, uh, to being uh, killed uh, in the in 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 this way, and um, and then we'll talk specifically about the uh, the actions people can take when they're when they're fitting out a new building, when they're const when they're designing, constructing, and then maybe some retrofitting that people can can do. Because I've got a funny feeling that's what Kayla is uh, is interested in. Excellent. So yeah. Um... So the birds most impacted, it actually depends on where you are geographically uh, and how tall your buildings are and whether or not it's birds that are migrating at night or birds that are migrating during the day or birds that are not migrating. Um, so diversity is very different throughout the year. Um, winter birds are generally uh, Dark-eyed juncos in the east, it's slate-colored juncos, and white-throated sparrows, uh, unfortunately lots and lots of robins. In spring, your diversity, it's weird, like we had, if I'm not mistaken, like 23 to 25 species um, hitting in the spring, and 23 to 25 species hitting during the summer. But the overlap between them was basically robin, morning American robin, not European, um, American robin, black-capped chickadee, morning doves. Everything else varied. Uh, some were American goldfinches, uh, some were chipping sparrows, and the yeah, the timing of it was really weird because obviously with migration you get warblers and nuthatches. Um, so many Lincoln sparrows, oddly not too many song sparrows. In southern Illinois, I got wood thrushes, hermit thrushes, Swainson's thrushes. Southeast, Southeast Michigan, mostly Swainson's thrushes. Um, in Illinois, we had a handful of sap suckers, downy woodpeckers, red-bellied woodpeckers. Uh, in Michigan, it's still a lot of those, but also flickers as well. Um, and kinglets like mad. I hardly got any kinglets in Illinois, but again, this can all vary depending on the building, what habitat is nearby, what birds are going to be in the area. Um, I never would have even thought about kingfishers in Illinois, and we seem to get one a year, um, belted kingfishers in, in Southeast Michigan for the buildings that we cover. So it's a weird way to keep track of what birds are in the area, but it's it's kind of a an effective way to do that. Like oven birds, they're a type of warbler. 
that have really cool nests. Um, they hit like popcorn in Illinois and in Michigan, we've hardly, you know, I think we've picked up single digits. Um, that being said, for the urban areas with high rises and lots of nocturnal collisions, brown creepers, woodcocks, um, rails, which is bizarre to me, but hey, soros are gonna hit. Um, that's stuff that we really very rarely get at the low rises that I cover. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating. I don't think we're ever going to understand enough uh, to really pinpoint how and why some species hit more than others. Um, there are some studies indicating that lights causing distractions to migrating birds, um, at least for species that vocalize a lot in flight, will cause their other vocalizing kin to also get distracted. And so the species that call are more likely to cluster um, in those areas than the birds that don't have a lot of flight call activity. Um, but I would rather just fix all of the problems that we know are in light and glass <laughs> and hopefully never get to the point where we understand how and why all the, the fine things happen, because at that point we will probably be out of birds, quite frankly. Well, well we'll dive into, into those corrective strategies in a second, but it just came to mind that nearly all of those species you mentioned are what I would loosely categorize as small birds. Mm -hmm. And and our discussion so far has really um, been talking about those low rise and mm -hmm. mid mid story buildings, you know, four, five, maybe six stories. Uh, Anecdotally, I know it's not really in your, you know, sort of direct sphere of experience, but with the people that you are uh, consulting with over over these issues, uh, are there are there examples where high rise buildings, taller buildings, um, lead to the mortality of larger birds? I mean, I'm thinking of those, you know, ducks and storks and uh you know the y y your raptors in in america m many of those uh passive mi uh, passage migrants as well so do taller buildings cause the the deaths of larger birds so taller buildings can cause the deaths of small birds small buildings can cause the deaths of large birds uh, there's ample documentation of grouse, uh, hawks, turkeys. Um, recently, recently, I guess it's in the last decade, uh, there's been documentation of a turkey vulture smashing through uh, a, a window, I believe, on it. Oh, yeah, I did see yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's certainly not unheard of. Um, unfortunately, I, I, peregrine and I saw, falcon. I think it was, uh, sorry, yeah. yeah falcons regularly but I, I saw somewhere i think it was in was either in was either in miami or it was in um santiago in chile but a brown pelican had 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 been picked up on the uh, on the pavement um yeah owls yeah. certainly hit um yeah we've in downtown detroit a friend of mine sent me photos of a ruddy duck Eventually we did get the specimen, but um, yeah, ducks certainly hit. Um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but if you look up, I don't know if they made it national or international, but there is like a dead duck day. That one was based on a window strike. Oh, please, um, please send me the, uh, the, the link if you have that later. <laughs> And for people who want to get right in the weeds, I'll put that in the uh, in the various dis uh, descriptions and whatnot. Yeah, of course. It, it was homosexual necrophilia in mallards, so it's certainly um, something like that's um, uh, that's a that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, but thanks, Heidi. You, Heidi Wonders. has given me the link too. I love that you had that at your fingertips. You literally just have to Google dead duck and it pops up with dead duck day. Yeah, dead, dead duck day marks that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will. Oh, what have I done? Sorry. Uh, I've done something here. Um, but yeah, will, peregrine uh, falcons are extremely high risk when it comes to you know they love urban areas because it feels like cliffs they've got plenty of pigeon snacks uh, i want to say it was 2017 or 2018 there were like half a dozen stories of you know freshly fledged baby peregrine falcons that were banded so we knew exactly who they were we knew where they nested they were they grew up on nest cams that were watched by thousands of people um and, you know, within a couple of weeks of fledging, hit buildings. Um, I want to say the Cornell Red-Tailed Hawk Cam has had the same situation where um, celebrity raptors hit buildings. Uh, I think one hit a bus shelter. Um, and that's, I feel like that should be a level of awareness um, that gets people doing things. But the the inaction route is the easiest route so very frustrating okay, okay. well rather than get tied up in what people aren't doing because i think um <laughs> there's plenty of that, that. Uh, that's right i mean uh, i mean you've got you've got 19 years of uh, of of that experience of what people don't do mm -hmm. uh, but let's uh, let's first talk about what people who are designing and building new buildings can do and, and and let's leave light out for the moment let's just talk about treating or design design principles and then treatment and selecting the materials uh, to go into a building what can people do where can they get information if if a architect or a um, uh, draft person who just happens to come across the the show where can what can they do where can they find out about it so the short answer is call me or email me <laughs> just save birds at gmail.com i say that first and foremost because every project is different and the products that are available to prevent bird strikes perform very differently in different environments and what i mean by that is Right now, UV is the poster child of, I, I'm not sure if I want to call it a fad, but um, it's all the rage. It's new technology. People love it because they can't see it. But UV products are only really effective in a very narrow range of installations. So, Can you explain what a UV product is? is yeah. it like is it is it something that reflects uv light absorbs uv, UV light or or transmits uv light a, a little bit of all of the above um so there are several uv products on the market they're mostly designed for new installations or retrofits so they're you know glass glass it's not a, a product that you slap on existing glass um they tend to be UV absorbing versus UV reflecting patterns in contrasting ways with dense enough patterns that birds should see them and avoid them. There's an asterisk next to every single word I just said because there are three fairly popular UV based bird deterrent products that have very different patterns, very different uh, UV absorption and reflection, and uh, two out of three I would not actually suggest ever because they don't work. Uh, and then the third one, if you put it in a situation where it's backlit or if it is um, at the end of a vegetative tunnel where birds are easily funneled towards it, like there's so many things you can do to undermine the efficacy of a UV product that it's really like if you install it just have some ideas in the back of your mind as to how you're going to fix it when things hit because yeah it's <laughs> it's not a, a great but that's what people want right now because 
birds can theoretically can. see UV spectrum, but not all birds can see the UV spectrum. So it's a complicated mess. So call me. Okay. It sounds like we need to do a whole other um, discussion about UV products and, and how they work, but, but to, to and it depends on the project, really. Yeah. Like, there's well, some well, projects where it would probably be fine. To summarise how they work is that um, it, it, if it uh, the products absorb the uh, UV light, which is out there in the spectrum that we can't see, but it's out there in the in in the environment. the The product absorbs it, and the theory is that birds can see UV light. So they can see that there is something there rather than clear space and they avoid it. Is that the theory? Sort of. So the the products <laughs> are, are sort of stacked. So they're, again, depending on the product, UV reflectant next to UV absorbent. So there's supposed to be more contrast there. Um, but because birds can see our entire spectrum plus UV and the UV wavelength is very weak, uh, it, it's it's up against a lot of odds. Okay. So, yeah, but but yes, but the, broadly speaking, but yes. The, <laughs> but the best thing to do uh, is for uh, at the design stage, the conception and design stage of a project is for the that the people involved in that and responsible for that to contact yourself because. There, there, there are not a ready pool of people with your skill set to do the advising. So here's a great big, uh, uh, it's just savebirds dot com, um, so... and 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 sorry, sorry Heidi, but I, I just want to sort of get right out there that the design stage is crucial. You you want to minimise any collisions that are going to occur by good design before you start thinking about correcting a problem that you already have and you will have a problem is that fair yeah one of the things that i don't think the research community myself included has done a very good job of communicating is i mean architects are ethically obligated to tell their clients what kind of environmental impact a building is going to have so what they're not able to say because this information isn't really broadly available again because it depends on the project like my library i can guarantee that even if the architect was thinking about environmental impact they'd be looking at maybe runoff um like they're not thinking birds and if they are thinking birds well depending on how you're defining a flyway the entire continent is a flyway um they're not going to be able to say, hey, this building is going to kill 500 birds a year. Do you want to do something to make that like five or 50? Um, instead, they're like, hey, do you want to make a bird friendly building? And they're like, oh, no, what if that's expensive? So like the part that they're missing entirely is the part where as soon as you put glass in the environment, birds will die. It's just how many do you want to die because of your project? Um, and architects don't have the information to say that. They also don't have adequate information um, right now. So window collisions have really only been studied since the late 1970s. This isn't like concrete or steel where we've got, you know, ages of material research and how it impacts everything else. This is more like lead paint and asbestos. Like we just started to figure out that this is bad and it's gonna take a while to phase it out. But in the meantime, we should know better and do better. But the resources for knowing better and doing better are still not finely, finely tuned enough to be broadly applicable. So um, like, I love the American Bird Conservancy. I can't say it enough. Everything in the bird collision community right now is based on the work of Daniel Clem who founded the entire field of research and the resources available for architects are basically from the American Bird Conservancy. So they have product database, uh, which is super fascinating, but a lot of people look at threat factor scores. So products get tested um, 
and they're assigned a number depending on how many birds tried to avoid it in the test. Not all of the current technologies are appropriate uh, for the test. The test is not appropriate for all of the technologies. So you can have a really good product like vertical first surface acid etch stripes. They do great in the wild. Uh, as long as the spacing is good, you good being two inches or less, because uh, hummingbirds exist in North America and the tunnels, the test tunnels in uh, Europe don't have to deal with hummingbirds. But anyway, hummingbirds are another story entirely. Point, point being, um, the resources that exist for architects should be taken kind of as generalizations, but not as project specific endorsements, if that makes sense. That that does make sense. Um, Joe, thanks for your contribution in the in the live uh, uh, live audience. Joe has told us that uh, had a large uh, is that uh, pronounced Butio red tail Butio, hawk, yeah. Hit, hit a window at knee level and died at Penn State University. So so that's a that's a large raptor. Or uh, that's a mid-sized raptor, isn't it? Really, and it's pretty um, large for the US. Yeah. Um, hitting it, hitting it knee level. So that just shows any window is a dangerous, dangerous. And Joe, I've, I can see your, your next comment. And sorry for the podcast audience. Um, you, it's much more fun when you come in live. Joe, can you can you tell me what you mean by uh, about the unsafe uh, thing? Well, that sounds like something we really need to discuss in the in the Q and A and comment section at the uh, uh, at the back end of the uh, of the conversation. Uh, so, what what I heard from from what you were just telling us there, Heidi, is that. Um, you can't do a one size fits all kind of solution because yeah. the species that are in all of the different flyways need different specifications. Not, and no. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't mean a species in one flyway will be different, but I mean that if, if you come up with a standard that fits Europe, which looks successful in, in reducing deaths by a certain percentage you can't model that for somewhere that has hummingbirds if so, if it's not suitable for hummingbirds so the in in that case yes um i i am very curious though because i know uh, the european tests have generally fallen into a, a two by four or four by four pattern for generally accepted spacing purposes um, but I don't have any information on how well that spacing works for fire crests and gold crests. Um, in the US, our equivalent of fire crest and gold crest is ruby crown kinglet and golden crown kinglet. Um, and they still will hit two by four inch spacing. So I'm not sure how the testing has gone over there. But basically, once you've hit the two by two inch spacing, broadly speaking, you will be preventing most strikes. Okay. When it and, comes and, when it comes sorry. to like broadly applicable codes that you can just copy and paste, I love what Canada has done. Um, they instead of saying that you need X Y Z products, they've kind of given an outline of um, what visual elements need to exist you can use whatever you want um it needs to meet certain guidelines uh and if things are still hitting then you need to fix it um but it's it's not like something for arizona is going to be very different than something for new york in terms of just a code because the way birds interact with the environment is pretty much head on with spacing appropriate to their body so when you talk about a two by two, and we're talking inches yes. um, spacing, are you talking and and uh, explain to me what that is? It is that it, it it's a visual cue for mm -hmm. for the birds, 
but is it like a an etching uh, in in product? Is it like a laser or acid etching, or is it a decal, or is it something like an irid- iridescent uh, uh, film that can be applied, or is it something like a solid sticker? I mean, what what yeah. is required? And this is in retrofitting. I think we're we're talking about. You can also. We? You can also, so like my library locally has used acid etch uh, first surface two by two inch dots. The dots are um, how many millimeters? Like quarter size of, of a coin? Like a, like no, they're, they're a pretty small. Or they're, they're like quarter of, the size of a tic tac. Okay. So the dots, the dots are quite small. Big, uh, big raindrops? <laughs> very big rain. Yeah, that, that works. Um, so you've got, a big raindrop every two inches. Um, but because of that frosty, hazy look, it indicates that there's something that the bird can't fly to or through. Um, I prefer stripes because those work in more conditions um, because etch works by diffusing the light. Acid etch stripes uh, give you much better contrast if you've got um, like a, a bright sky over a dark wood um, or marsh as as long as there's contrast between your sky and your tree line you'll get the darkness of the tree line kind of pulled into the sky and then the brightness from the sky diffused into the tree line so that's where you get your contrast um but so that's acid etch tends to pretty much be new construction um for retrofits it can be uh feather friendly has these fantastic little vinyl dots that are super easy come in great preset patterns i'm a huge fan um but you can do almost and when i say almost anything i mean i've had people who were frustrated with their home uh, take a tube of lipstick and add a dot of lipstick every two inches across a window because it works you can take um like right now my computer is propped up on a paint marker chalk marker thing um I did that to my front door, just a little dot every two inches. I, I, I want to test my memory. Uh-huh. Didn't you do something similar at your old place? Like, didn't you apply, I don't think it was lipstick, but it was something else, just dots in a, in that kind of uh, spacing that had a had a big effect for a, a window, which was really problematic at your uh, so the uh, thankfully the old that. apartment the old apartment didn't really have too many issues with that. Um, however, I will say that post-it note checkerboards are amazing. Uh, they're not foolproof, but when you've got a grid of post-it notes that are closely spaced, you get enough contrast that it pops. Um, you almost stand a chance. Uh, if it's on the outside of the glass, it's obviously way better might not hold up to weathering as well. But um, yeah, there are a lot of really creative fixes. There are, um, I'm sure I've sent you the link before for Acopian bird savers. That's basically nylon paracord that's hung in front of the glass every four inches. I would prefer it to be three and a half inches. Uh, So if you do it yourself, you can do three and a half. Um, But the default that they have available for ordering is four inches. but yeah, there there's so many different ways that you can meet the spacing requirements. Uh, Kayla, when we get into the back end of the conversation and we've sort of stopped doing the podcast, uh, we'll we'll tease out your query a little bit more, and perhaps um, uh, perhaps Heidi can give you an idea of something that fits your uh, your particular purpose. Um, uh, Heidi. I, uh, I wonder how much movement you think there's been. I mean, it was about um, about three odd years ago, I think, since we started having these mm-hmm. these conversations. How much movement have you seen, uh, or do you think there there is? <laughs> and I think, as you related, uh, cost being the, the the factor, but you also brought up ethics for mm-hmm. architects. I'm just wondering how much movement you think there's been, one, in architects being aware of the ethical considerations and actually 
taking them into account when they design a, a new building or embark on the research for a new project. Uh, yeah, do, do you think you've three years has seen much of a shift there? And then perhaps you can mention whether it's all about the tin, the tin tax, it's all about the dollars and cents uh, so when the rubber hits the road. The short answer is yes. There has been a lot of awareness in the last three years. Um, the long answer is it's not because of the ethics, it's because of the codes. Um, more places have been passing legislation. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, basically prior to 2020, you know, there were over a dozen codes and ordinances throughout the U.S. on the books, but that number has basically doubled since so, since then. Are, are these local building codes or are they state or federal? In most cases, they are local building codes. Um, a couple are state level, but the state level ones are full of clauses that it only applies to, so like the state of illinois for example their code the state code applies to state owned buildings that are new construction okay so it doesn't apply to anything on the, on the historic registry it doesn't apply to buildings that are being leased or rented uh, it doesn't necessarily apply to retrofits there's a note in there on retrofits but it has to be like more than 50 percent of the glass that's being retrofitted and then uh if the cost is prohibitive then they're off the hook for doing anything like it's there's so many loopholes for codes and ordinances that like i'm glad they exist but we need to give them more teeth because you can follow them to a t and still have a really bad building so the 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 reason I was really interested in, in that is uh, uh, we always look for action points with mm -hmm. uh, when I'm doing the show. Yeah. So people can have an, an impact by lobbying their local government agencies yeah. and the local people who are responsible for assessing uh, new building permits, applications, or whatnot, mm -hmm. and actually making people aware of this because I think that's part of the problem, isn't it? In in, in that uh, that there won't be people who are stamping approvals when 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 a design or when a project comes across the desk. Mm -hmm. There's going to be thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people who just are simply unaware and therefore and of course because they're not aware they don't consider it so so if you're concerned and you feel powerless um make a phone call write a letter and ask if people consider oh. this when they do applications and then make them aware of just so birds.com so another thing to point out is when so sustainability is obviously on everybody's hopefully on everybody's radar right now uh, because climate change and all of these goals to meet certain um, carbon carbon targets um, yes because because we have sustainable natural gas here now in in Australia did you know that we're, we're, we're the world's largest exporter of sustainable natural gas that is so wild. Um, know, between crazy, between greenwashing of things, which is also a huge problem, and um, just misunderstanding the like people see birds as an isolated issue. They're not lumping it into the larger sustainability picture. Um, but if you care about biodiversity and you're doing native landscaping, you are intentionally luring pollinators into your area, and that means you're bringing birds closer to danger. So the better your building is in terms of natural daylighting and habitat, the worse it's going to be for birds. So it's critical for those projects, especially to address it. But there are a lot of products that are bird safe that can help reduce carbon footprints. So uh, frit is a very popular um, ceramic powder baked into patterns on the glass. Those can Frit is used all over the place to reduce solar heat gain. Like just change up the pattern a little bit and make sure that it's in 
on the right surface and the right you know spacing um, and you can very easily combine your uh, solar heat gain reduction with bird safety so you're not actually getting charged anymore for a product that's bird safe um, you're meeting your targets um, plus if you do the lighting thing i think it was the fbi building in baltimore ended up saving over 20 percent on their lighting bills by turning their lights off at night. Who would have thought? Uh, so they do that year round now instead of just during migration. So when you start factoring in these little steps that, oh, oops, also help birds, it's not a huge you know, sacrifice. You just have to get a little creative with your patterning. So FRIT, is that F-R-I-T? Is that an acronym for, what's the acronym for? I don't or think it's it... actually an acronym. I think it's just so. So it's F L. Hang on, you, uh, I can see you've um, uh, F R I T. Mm -hmm. So if if uh, people want to Google that, they should be able to find the product. Um, uh, th thanks. It's a category for talking... of products, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to do some organising uh, live on the show here, Heidi. Um, a, a new introduction to the uh, bird emergency um, schedule of things is the Saturday morning uh, Habitat Gardening Show, uh, Saturday morning Australian Eastern Time. I want to invite you to come onto that so we can talk about um, uh, actually the, the products that you've been mentioning and... Um, how they can be brought in to garden design mm -hmm. principles and protocols because yeah, as you said we're because we're inviting uh birds and animals i mean bats and and whatnot as well uh, coming into our environment but let's put that aside because we'll we'll go on forever um uh, I've got a comment here too, and of course, if you're on the podcast, uh, thebirdemergency.com slash live is where you can find the all the upcoming live shows and be involved. Kayla has just um, asked a question, which uh, which I'll I'll pop up so you can uh, see it, Heidi. Uh, are the ceramic film window films are these all what you would call? Fritz, uh, or are Fritz like a a um, a tile? Tell a... So ceramic frit is basically only used in new construction because it is literally a baked on pattern. So it's uh, essentially a layering of the glass with a ceramic um, powder that gets baked into the pattern. Um, the window films are vinyl, so those can be either in dot form. Uh, stripe form. They can cover the entire window. Um, they're very versatile. There are lots of different colors and patterns and, and styles available. Like so basically they're, they're limitless essentially, options. So they're essentially a decal that yeah. people can get yeah. a fly. Okay. But, but um, when people I, say decal, they're usually talking about the one hawk sticker, which no, no, is going to be on my No, this is like a, like a vinyl wrap. So it's like a clear vinyl wrap that people would put on a car. And only it's some of them, specific, yes. yeah, yeah. So some of them, yes. just so, so you, you, I mean, obviously they're not the same thing, but you, that's the kind of uh, general type of product that, that mm -hmm. you're looking for. I imagine they're they're sort of in uh, various sizes, and you can buy them um, off yeah. the rack in 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 building supplies places. Would that be right? Other friendly, I adore because it basically is sold in little rolls of tape. Um, and the dots are pre-spaced for you. So you just have to like mark out your two inch pattern and then unroll it, rub the back of, I mean, you have to clean the window first yeah. with isopropyl alcohol. Um, Cause if you use a normal window cleaner, it leaves a residue. Anyway, follow the instructions, but you basically rub the back of the tape and then peel the backing off and the dots stay on the glass. And then you don't have to think about it for like 20 something years. Well, when we've got more time, um, mm -hmm. I'll uh, I'll get you. We'll, we'll actually do a walkthrough in, in in an episode that isn't made for podcast. Uh, that we can sort of do more visual stuff on 
Habitat Gardening with Grant on a uh, on a Saturday. So look out for that uh, in the next little while. Uh, we'll we'll work out those those dates. I'm really mindful of of, of the time. So uh, I think what we'll what we'll do now is is let people know that you have a bunch of resources on your website and some fantastic recommended reading one of my favorite books on this subject solid air is there so rather than me post all those links i'm going to say follow the link in the description or just go there now just savebirds.com to have a look at what uh heidi does and has been doing and we will keep the conversation with Heidi going for the live audience, they can uh, uh, stick around and, and ask a few questions before we've both got to bail out. But you need support to do all these things. You've got it, you're coordinating volunteers who are going through, um, you know, regular walks to collect specimens that can be used for research so people don't need to. Co- uh, take out uh, 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 living birds for their tissue samples in their necessary research. Now, the main way that you do that is through Patreon, correct? Yeah, so Patreon funding basically offsets the, the costs that um, are... Oh, gosh. So, for example... Last week, Friday, I was in Chicago for a presentation. Um, They covered fuel, they covered hotel. But that was two days of work that I missed, plus food, plus, 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 plus. So essentially, every speaking engagement I do, I'm out. If it's local, I'm only out like 50 to 100 bucks. If it's not local, it can be a couple hundred and then conferences. Um, So I originally started Patreon because I realized, like, since 2003, I've been buying my own Ziploc bags, which after a while, that really adds up. <laughs> like two decades of Ziploc bags <laughs> doesn't seem like much, but then there's all the Sharpies and the index cards and the color photocopies and, 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 and. So yeah, it just started as a way to like not just be funding all of it out of pocket. Um, every couple of years, we do get a grant to cover uh, interns to monitor the Eastern Michigan University campus, but uh, we haven't done that since COVID. So, um, yeah, we we aren't even grant based at this point. So. so, if you are able to support the amazing work that uh, uh, that Heidi does, and look, I can tell you how amazing it is because there just isn't. There just isn't anyone else doing it and there isn't anyone else making this information as easy as Heidi does. There are a lot of uh, for, people, but we're pretty scattered and very isolated. That Yeah, that, that's what I mean. The, it's not that there aren't people doing the work and doing great things. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. But a lot of it is attached to research, which is difficult to get and difficult to find unless you are used to finding research. But for people who might be just wanting to make a difference in their own garden or uh, they own one building in in a town in uh, in Ohio, country town in Ohio, and they want to make a difference, it's much easier to find information at justsavebirds.com to find where to find information than it is Googling uh, because you'll probably get uh, uh, some crypto crap in your f- top 10 uh, replies. <laughs> well, one on, of the hardest on things is honestly just fighting the misinformation and the outdated information because I have had people approach me and say, I did everything right. I followed the best practices to a T and birds are hitting my building left and right. I'm like, well, let's let's look at the resources that you used and they're using protocol from 2009 mm. And again, this, this field of research is very new and still evolving very quickly. So every six months, I update my information because it, it literally changes that fast. And look, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep the, these conversations happening as, uh, as, as new things 
uh, come up. Um, I'm, uh, and I really recommend it if you have no real understanding of the scope of the problem uh, that bird strike with windows um, uh, presents for just the survival of some species. And I'm not overblowing that because I want to uh, sort of place it in context. If a billion birds die in one flyway, just from this alone, and we add climate change and we, and we add habitat reduction into the mix, I don't think that I am being hyperbolic when I am saying that for some species, this can be an existential threat and that we need to be taking it seriously if we are proclaiming that we care. The, the short answer is yes. The longer answer that I forgot to mention earlier was, um, you know, this summer Canada had historic wildfires and these birds that hit in Chicago were the lucky ones who somehow managed to survive those fires. And now they're just hitting our buildings in spite of everything they've done to survive otherwise. It's not natural selection. It's not that these birds are young. It's not that these birds are old. It's not that they're new to cities. Um, it is literally just we have built invisible, deadly things for them. Uh, th that's right. And there's r rain shifting that's going on for different uh, distributions of different species. There's, uh, I mean, you mentioned wildfires. There is, uh, there is water drying up for places where birds are, uh, are used to breeding there are just so many threats and cats and wind turbines and yep. just drink yep. bird friendly coffee yep. fix your windows keep your cats inside and uh yeah calm. so <laughs> so let's try and keep it positive there are things that you can do to make a difference and you can find that at heidi's website uh just savebirds.com and i would uh ask you if you can uh spare a few bucks patreon.com slash just save birds is a really good place to um, uh, to get that info thanks Heidi um, thank you Grant uh, with that being said now now we go that gives me an edit point for me to put a a, a lovely outro but for those of you um, who are yeah. with us live here's your chance to um, uh, to ask a more specific question or put some um, uh, some more experiences in, we'll just you know give us maybe ten fifteen minutes of uh, of shooting the breeze, and uh, we'll see what comes up. Uh, Joe Joe did mention that he cannot comment further on mallards in polite society. Now, Joe, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about um mallards m mallards here are an existential threat for the pacific black duck um uh complex uh in the uh, australasia and the uh, and the pacific region uh other than that i don't really know yeah they'll hybridize um, with everything yeah and and i think uh certainly it was assumed that they ended up have, being the dominant uh, genetic force or factor. Um, uh, so, yeah, thank... We, uh, I, I think we've got less mallards in the parklands and, and uh, gardens that used to be present in, in Australia than, than now, but I've got no evidence other than what I've seen, I used to see like mallard, male mallards in breeding plumage all over Melbourne, uh, but I don't see so many now. I think people have just been removing them and not replacing them, And uh, but I think that's right. But Joe, tell us, why, why, the, why so down on mallards? Um, oh, and now, now that we've finished the podcast, uh, 
sort of discussion and we're having a little bit of fun. Today we're having a referendum in Australia. Well, today's the official day. I voted yesterday. Uh, and uh, we, we have early voting here. So, of course, the election is rigged and stolen. And, uh, and, and we have paper ballots. And you have to write, we had to write yes or no in a little box on the ballot paper. And we do it in pencil. Uh, we've done this the same way for uh, for as long as Australia's been doing uh, voting, I, I believe, or since we've had a national electoral commission. We even have a body that's funded by the election, by the government, called the Australian Electoral Commission. We've got one of those in each state too. And we are so viciously oppressed that we have to register to vote and we actually have an obligation to attend a polling place on on election day. And our elections happen on a Saturday. Fascinating. We are such a oppressed, you know, Stalinist regime here. Um, and, and can you believe it? Well, actually, this is where I'm not really poking fun. Uh, but can you believe that we've been a country since, uh, well, we're coming into uh, 122 years, I think, uh, since we've been an, a, a country, a unified country, not just a series of colonies from Britain. But it's taken until now for us to, uh, well, I think the, the referendum's going to fail, unfortunately to actually recognise the first peoples of the country who have been here for 65,000 years, continuing their their civilization. Sounds like and the same struggle up. Canada's up against right now. Well, yeah. Um, well, and of course, we've got the similar history. Um, I, and this isn't even talking about reparations or, or actually walking back some of the privilege that people like myself enjoy in this country and that people who are um, First Nations people, and that's not only the, what people know of as Aboriginal people, but also the uh, Torres, Strait, Torres Strait Islanders who occupy that um, territory between Papua New Guinea and, uh, and the, the northern tip of Queensland uh, in Australia. Um, it's just amazing how, how things take so long to happen. I was going to say, this conversation might happen in 50 years in the U.S. if we're really lucky. Oh, oh. I don't know if you if you know of the Majority Report, uh, a daily podcast slash live stream. I get up at 3 o'clock every morning to listen to it live or watch it, actually, on YouTube. Sam Cedar, mm -hmm. uh, Emma Vigland, and uh, Matt Leck are sort of the uh, intellectual heavyweights behind it Sam did an interview the other day with a professor who has just written a book that goes right back into the um, the basis for the dispossession of native peoples indigenous peoples worldwide that goes back to the authority of the Pope so we're talking going back 12 probably back to the 1100s or whatever but that the dispossession of native peoples by colonial uh, governments that are Christian, mm -hmm. all rooted back to this one doctrine. And none of it makes sense in, in today's context, but that America is the, or the US is the, uh, the case study, but that all of this dispossession is illegal under under modern uh, theories uh, and um, that we really should be looking at uh, if, if we really subscribe to universal basic human rights and all those principles that we should be proactive about uh, reparations and uh, and bringing our legislation sort of into compliance and I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't know. battle for sure. 
are you guys going to have a country in 50 years? That's another. And and then that's a serious question because you've got, what what is it, 40% of your country are cookers and nutcases nowadays. And that, I think that's what the uh, what the polling suggests is that 40% of your registered voters will vote for Donald Trump or someone of his ilk no matter what, no matter what evidence is in front of them. And to me, that's a country of cookers. How this, can you? How can this you go is on? why I'm really relieved to live very close to Canada right now. Yeah, um, but I've got a funny feeling that Canada will do what something very similar to what we do here in Australia. No American's going to get special favors to migrate to Australia. You're going to have to fit our skills criteria, and our skills criteria means that anyone who is not uh, tertiary educated, but with a in a field that we want, that's it. You can't come. And I'm sure Canada will do the same. New Zealand will do the same. The EU will do the same. Um, so anyway, that, that I'm definitely cutting this off for the the stuff for, for publication. But I, I'm I'm really quite terrified for what what's facing the good people of of the US. And 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 I'm not saying we don't have cookers here, but it's about four to seven percent of of we've got the we've got people with QAnon flags and anti vaxxers and all that here. But it's really small. And I think Canada's the same, but they're they're growing. Britain has gone off Britain's gone off the rails. Britain's gone completely off the rails. It's because they've uh, been taking notes from us. That uh, well, and 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 because their media is 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 also controlled by Murdoch. Um, it's really it's really frightening. Um, uh, I mean, can you can you see like put it in a ten or fifteen year? Well, if we said sixteen years, that's four electoral cycles or four presidential electoral cycles. Yeah. It's eight. House of Representative cycles in the US. Can you see? Can you see a clear turnaround? Honestly, I, for one, no. For two, not sure I would want to. Uh, the way things have been going, I have a little bit of faith because some of our um, freshly elected politicians are remarkably young. But if you look at the overwhelming majority of our politicians, the uh, the demographics don't really support what the actual population demographics are. Uh, our, our youngsters are open-minded, but uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Shane. Um, uh, we, we we've already done an hour and a uh, an hour and a half of safe bird chat, and we're just winding up, waiting for people to have um, questions about this. And uh, and because I'm doing a another uh, show in about. Um, an hour and a quarter, and I was, I'm, I'm a bit energized because I was really upset with some of the conversations I heard while I was standing in line yesterday um, uh, to cast my vote in the referendum. I'm a little bit, bit embarrassed too, Heidi, in that when we had a change of government here, I was really energized and I thought, look, Australia's shown itself to be a positive and um, outward looking country and we were going to get serious about climate change and uh, habitat reduction at a grant on a grand scale would stop and and a minister that said no more extinctions would mean it and two you know two years down the track as we gear up to another electoral cycle uh, New Zealand are, 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 are having an election today too by the way and it looks like they are going to pivot to the right as well. Um, I'm sort of embarrassed to think that I had the rose-coloured glasses on and was so so positive. And I haven't seen, just not seeing positive stuff in any of the things I care about um, happening. And you're right there in, uh, well... Ohio and uh, Michigan. Michigan. I mean, that's. Uh, uh, I mean, Mi Mi Michi Mi Michigan's where where you have a militia 
uh, tried to kidnap your governor. Um, an armed militia stormed stormed in, and uh, here we go. Kayla's got us onto bird thing. This will make you happy, Shane. Uh, and we've only got about five more minutes where where uh, Heidi can stick with us. Do you have an opinion on window screens? Now, yeah. does that use them does that mean fly, is that flywire screens? So that uh, which is just a typical uh, you can open up your window and keep the flies out. Uh, as they're long, a great deterrent. Yep, as long as it is in front of the window on the outside. In the U.S., a lot of operable windows for some reason have the screen inside the window. Um, but yeah, if it's on the outside, it's not perfect, but nothing is perfect. Hmm. But that's a great option. Um, I'm not sure how many homeowners associations problems you have over there, but in the U.S., screens are one of the only things that some homeowners associations will consider appropriate. That being said, though, um, moving your feeders as close to the window as possible will also help the survival rates. Um, oh, Shane, too, this is directed for you. I hope you did catch the replay. I did replay the show and it's up on Facebook and, of course, on, on YouTube last week's um, Habitat Gardening and, of course, in... Um, uh, in an hour and a quarter, we're firing up again for uh, berries, uh, berry bearing plants uh, is the topic for today, loosely, uh, but we're happy for anything there. Kayla's asked, what are the drawbacks for, um, uh, for screens, Heidi? Um, for the most part, there aren't too many. The occasional situation so because screens have different properties um like you can get really thick screens that are intended for like super bright areas um those are fabulous either pale or, or super dark um like in arizona you get screens that from the outside almost make the entire window look opaque um some of the screens though are very fine mesh that are almost clear those are not optimal um, I mean, I have picked up dead birds at windows that had screens, um, but those are few and far between, thankfully. With hummingbirds, there is actually a chance that when they hit, they can get their beaks stuck in it. Um, so that's something to, to consider for folks who have hummingbirds in the area. But um, overall, they're a, a really good option if you can't get your hands on some of the other um, Again, I really like feather friendly <laughs> or, or uh, check markers. Um, yeah, well, I'll um, I'll I'll chase down some of those products. I'm I'm not sure what Kayla means here. With do you think that there could be bans to be made with window screens companies? I'm not, or, or is that bonds? Um, I think that's bonds. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's bonds. Uh, I mean, some companies already market for bird safety. Um, there are some like netting companies that I assume started out making like bird proof orchard netting hmm. and then switched to putting it in front of windows. There are some places that do that uh, and they mount the screens a few inches away from the glass. The trick there is if the netting is too wide, birds can get their entire head stuck. Yeah. If it's yep. not taut enough, they can still hit the window with enough force to be injured. Um, so that gets into a, a weird situation. Yeah, in, in an Australian context, we had, um, you know, netting over fruit trees and whatnot has been really popular for yeah. 50 years or whatever to, to protect apples and plums and peaches and pears, etc. So... They they started marketing bird friendly netting that that stopped the birds' heads getting caught, but of course it then became a real problem for bats. So uh, so yeah, netting is yeah. problematic uh, in in so many ways. Uh, I think Kayla, I I really appreciate the 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 input. Um, uh, solar screens are popular for heat yes. control is, an, is another comment. Those are the thicker screens. Yeah. 
I think what what I'd like to do, uh, Heidi, in in the future, and hopefully we can do that fairly soon, is if you could give me an idea of the products that you've been talking about and that uh, that Kayla and others have mentioned that are available in the States or maybe in North America, and we'll try and pull together some for North America, some for Europe that might be available globally, and I'll have a look at what what's being done here, and we'll do like a habitat gardening um, show where we can do that. There, uh, there oh, is here a, we go. I, as I, I say, there's I a tab on my website that. that lists a bunch of these products too. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we, we'll we'll just make sure that we've got visuals and and whatnot presented, and I've got that link. Thank you, uh, Heidi. I did uh, I did look at it uh, yesterday as well, but I just didn't I didn't put all the vi visuals together. Um, uh, yeah, um, Shane's just got this. I know you've got to go in a second. I'll just address what Shane's got. Um, uh, Shane, if if you've got any sort of things that you'd like to talk about on the Habitat Gardening show, um, I mean, I'm just having one sort of loose topic every every time, but I I'm going out. I mean, if you if you uh, talking about edging and things like that, irrigation products. There's so many different things that we can talk about. I'm going to go out with the camera and do um, do pieces that means I can show you rather than just talk about the kinds of things that I think are really good and then we'll look at products that are available in an Australian context and as uh, hopefully as things get going, I can be talking to people from other parts of the world, obviously, from all over different parts of Australia so that we can make this whole idea of bringing in... I really liked what you said, Heidi. Invite You're inviting birds, and it's even wider, animals into your environment. And we really have an ethical obli ob obligation to make those places safe. And that's the kind of discussion I want to just keep... Um, uh, keep bringing it back to, but always trying to give some recommendations of of what you can easily source and find. So Shane, uh, please think about some of the uh, 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 some questions and comments for today. Uh, if you keep me engaged, I won't wander off on my dismay about what's going on just around the world. I've kept away from the really big story, and that has that's been going on for a week, which has just made me. Inf made me so angry with the way it's been covered um and i'm still dying my hair ukrainian blue and yellow so you know how that's I, mean, I, I mean i mean i'm i'm so dismayed that the the potential success of the ukrainians is totally dependent on money coming in from from the us i think that's i think pretty much everyone understands that but there's now a move to not support ukraine anymore but to, but to support another government and i just cannot i can't wrap my brains around how one one is good one is bad i cannot i don't know how we can oh, anyway i don't want to even get into it because it's so everyone's so charged about just whatever people say about it but yeah Anyway, mm -hmm. oh, we'll, my partner's uh, family uh, is in Ukraine, so uh, yeah, it's, it's um, way too close to home. I, 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 I just don't understand how it was good enough to start, but it's not good enough to finish. I mean, if it, and, and uh, anyway, I mean, we got the, and we got this stuff going on in Burma. We've got it going on in the northern fringes of India and all over Africa. It's just. These things are happening everywhere, and we're just blind to them. Anyway, I'm not going to go there anymore. It's depressing enough. Heidi, um, uh, thanks. Uh, I'll I'll send you a calendar link and see if we can. Um, for a Saturday morning, it would. It's an hour's time from now is when I start. So I don't know if that's too late for you or or whatever. But that would be for tonight. Amazing. It's too late, but. Uh... Next week I won't be in town. Maybe the week. Oh no, no, no! We're not doing it now. I'm, I'm thinking maybe three, four, five weeks down the track. I'll just send you a link, uh, the calendar link, and you choose a, uh, choose whenever it suits you, and then we'll really, you know, we'll prepare it well, and um, promote Sounds it like well. 
yeah. Great. It's always Thank great talk, talking you. to you. I, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad we got to catch up. Uh, uh, folks, for live, uh, Kayla, um, who who else do we have? Shane, of course. Vanessa uh, and Joe. Oh, Vanessa and Joe. Yeah, thanks. Joe, I'm still puzzled about the Mallards. I really want... Uh, I really want to know what's going on with the Mallards. Uh, Vanessa, thanks. It was nice to uh, meet you all, and I hope you have subscribed and that you will um, pop in again, join the Riot Squad when uh, when you see us going live. Uh, I've got some really, really great guests lined up for the next two to three weeks, and we're popping up um, everywhere. It's Bird Week beginning Monday here in Australia. So the Aussie bird count gets underway. Um, Monday with Holly is back uh, with Holly from Bird Life Australia this Monday at midday. Uh, have it, uh, Photography Friday is back next week too on Friday and Wednesday, the bird watching deep dive with Ricky, Ricky Coglin, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. That's also on. Uh, apart from normal... Uh, uh, normal stuff. Birdling a bird. I got to say, I'm glad that you're a big fan of Just Save Birds. And uh, mate, mate, I don't know whether you're a mate or whether you're a. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm glad you're a, a huge fan of Bird Emergency too. Even when I get ranty and go off on a tangent, um, very disappointed that apparently I'm not in the top thirty. Uh, bird podcast in Australia. I'm bloody the original, but I'm not. I'm not there. I think that's because I spent four months not publishing anything. So, uh, anyway. well, now that you're back, now that I'm back, we're going to be delivering bangers. Uh, 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 yes, we'll be delivering bangers. I've got some amazing people lined up that we're just. Um, yeah, it's going to be fab and. Uh, and I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know whether I've got to wind back my emotions, or whether I've got to put them out there more. I just don't know. Uh, I think I know what Shane would say. <laughs> anyway, time for us get to go. Thanks so much, Heidi. Uh, Thanks for, for night time over there. Love talking to you. Love your work. Uh, hopefully, cool. we'll see some of you in the right squad in about an hour's time when I put my horticulture hat on because i am a horticulturist and we talk habitat gardening well i'll talk to you in a couple weeks yeah yeah uru see ya take care bye